Good morning. Good morning. It is uh, good for Laura and me to be here with you again and have this fellowship with you. Uh, this morning I'm going to speak on another psalm. This is the third time I've spoken on a psalm. Uh, we looked at Psalm 51, a book spiritual renewal for our lives. We looked at Psalm 66, which is dealing with the area of injustices. Uh, maybe we'll turn down the volume a little bit and get a little bit of feedback, please. Thanks. And so we looked at Psalm 66 about injustices. Today we're going to look at another psalm. And the reason looking at these psalms is I really truly believe that the psalms are very important to shape our lives, to fit into our transformation of lives, to teach us how to pray, to teach us how to respond to God, to deal with people around us. And so the psalms are very, very important. And uh, just uh, last week or so, I, I came up with a new book, uh, called Growing in Holiness Through the Psalms. It's read about transformation. But the Psalms are really a guidebook to shape our lives in all areas of life. And so this is a culmination of a tier project. And I mention it to you because the Psalms are important for our lives. They're part of Scripture. And how did the people in the Old Testament and even the New Testament, Jesus and the Apostles, always bring back to the Psalms? The Psalms are so important. So they're not just to comfort us, Psalm 23, when we're down, but to instruct us, to teach us how to pray, how to respond to God and people around us. So anyway, this book just came out to your project, Growing in Holiness Through the Psalms. That's the theme, and it's through Charles Spurgeon's um, book on the treasury of David, which uh, is based also on my book I did on the meditations uh, for one year. So, so today we're going to look at Psalm 88. And it's not a cheery song, <laughs> but I hope it will encourage you nevertheless, okay? And uh, there you see it, all these kind of words like that. So let's, let's pray. That's God's word to speak to our hearts this morning. Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we worship you. Our hope is in Jesus, and we thank you that we can uh, look to you at all times in all situations. Thank you for this opportunity now to spend time in the Word of God and that it will instruct us, teach us, but also that we can apply it to our lives and say, what does it have to say for us so that we can be transformed even in the times of darkness. So Lord, we ask that you open our minds and our hearts to receive from you and that we would give back to you our obedience, our lives to you in a fuller measure. Thank you, Lord, for this time together. We pray in your name. Amen. So many years ago, many years ago, I pastored in a small church. It was my first church out of seminary. I had all the answers to life. And uh, I went to the small church and had many, many conflicts before we arrived. And uh, it continued to have conflicts after I arrived. And it was just a church full of turmoil all the time. And uh, relationships were strained and broken and it took an emotional toll on me uh, it affected me physically my whole intestinal system was affected because my nerves were shot there are times i went to my office just down on my knees crying before god what's going on here never would have expected such an awful time like this and after a while I began saying, Lord, where are you in all this? I began, even though I knew God existed, it's like, where are you, God? You have abandoned me. You've called me to this church. It was an awful, awful experience of just feeling rejected by people, not all people. The church grew, but there was lots of opposition, and like God had abandoned me. So it was a difficult time. Oh, my. I hate to even think of those times because those were deep, dark days. But of course, then, as our brother prayed this morning, mentioned this morning, those dark days are nothing compared to the dark days other people feel today. Parents, mothers, fathers, siblings who lost loved ones, <laughs> sisters, brother, teachers. The dark, dark days people go through, that pastor, that church, whose own daughter is killed. <laughs> What a dark time for that pastor, that congregation. So my pain was not, is nothing like what these people are going through. And it's quite possible, though, that you've experienced some dark days of grief, suffering, and pain in your life. 
Uh, there's a physical suffering. Perhaps in the past, you have gone through prolonged sickness or illness for a period of time. Things that come up unexpectedly. There's two people we know, one in the 70s, another person in her 50s. They almost died. If they had gone to the hospital, they would die within a day or so. These things happen, full of dark days, pain, and possible grief there. If it hasn't been for yourself, perhaps someone else you know, a loved one who's going through a real difficult time of sickness, prolonged sickness, unexpected sickness, that, that surprises you, takes you by surprise. So there's that area. There's a relational and emotional pain as well, of being abandoned and rejected. I know a godly man who hasn't been able to talk to son for 20, 30 years. The son has just rejected him. And these things happen in life. The feeling of being rejected. Then there's the people who experience separation, divorce. Dark days, indeed. And so, out of these kind of experiences, we can begin to have a time of spiritual pain. A spiritual time of suffering. Like, where are you, God, in all this? You're supposed to be my companion, my friend. Where are you? Do you really love me? Do you really care for me? Why don't you answer my prayers? I think of one man, he was an elder in my church. An elder in my church, but he began to become more and more cynical toward God, and he just left the faith. He just got so cynical about this God that we worship, and no, he walked away from the faith. So these are difficult experiences, physical, relational, emotional, spiritual pain that we can go through. Fortunately, though, the God has given us the Psalms, which allow us to enter deeply into the experience of others. And we find that we can relate to these writers of the Psalms who give us insight and words to express when we struggle to make sense of what's going on in our own lives, in our souls. And so they shape our conversations with God. And one Psalm that helps us in these dark days is Psalm 88. This psalm is an individual lament, prayed by a person who has been ill a long time, has no friends, and is near to death. Dark days. And this psalm does not end with the psalmist worshiping God like so many other psalms. It's the bleakest. It is the saddest psalm in all the psalms. And so you, so you may think I've come here to make you feel more depressed. That's not my intent. But that's reality sometimes. We face those dark days. And the psalm, I believe, does encourage us. We will find ways that the psalm does encourage us in the midst of all this grief and sadness in the psalm here. So, first, I want us to look at um, this is the one we're right back here. Let's go to the first one. We hear the psalmist's painful cry in this dark days here. Uh, go back earlier. Go way back earlier. Okay, there we go. So we hear the psalmist's painful cry in his dark days, verses 1 and 2. Twice he admits that he's crying in these two verses, and he repeats this in verse 13. And the cry is more than just a gentle cry. This is emotional sobbing. He is just pouring out his heart. He's just sobbing so intense, intently here. It's a very intense thing. And he does this day and night in verse 1. And he does this every day. So morning, evening, every day. He's just pouring out his heart to God. He's in the most difficult time. What does this mean for us? In some circles, even church circles, spiritual maturity is measured by being stoic, stone-faced, stiff upper lip. I don't experience pain. I'm tough. I'm spiritual. Right? And so that no emotions are expressed to others or to God. But the psalmist affirmed that it's all right to cry out to God. It's all right to cry out to God. And we are voicing our pain and our grief to Him. And notice that the psalmist is not just crying, but he's crying out to God. Okay? He's crying out to God. He turns to God who saves me in verse 1. God is willing to save or help him because of the relationship which exists between God and the psalmist. Most 
the phrase, O Lord. It's uppercase in your Bible, uppercase usually. Meaning this is the Jehovah God. This is the God of the covenant between God and his people. God has covenanted, he is committed to say, I love you no matter what. I am committed to you, unconditional love to you. This is the Jehovah God who made that covenant with his people. And so the point is, God will always be faithful to us. He is always faithful to us. Even in the darkest days, we can say, this is your character, this is your nature. You are Jehovah God, the God of the covenant. And so we see what happens here is this man who's going through dark days, he is turning to his Jehovah God, this God who I believe in, to be committed to me, unconditional commitment to him. This is important. The psalmist is reminding us to turn to the Lord in our pain and our grief. <laughs> yeah, we know so often when people go through dark times that even Christians, they'll go through self-improvement programs. They'll find ways. I just need to think positive thoughts, and that's okay, it's that. I just need to look at some nice poetry or read poetry, and all that is good or they begin to turn inward and they find ways to medicate their pains. Whether it's drugs or alcohol or finding some way to ease their pain like that. The psalmist is encouraging us to turn to God. He is the one who we turn to. That's what he does here. So this is a dark song, but he turns to God, nothing else here. Okay? Second point I want to make is I want us to see the reasons for his dark days. There's three reasons here. Okay, let's move on here. Next uh, slide. There. Okay. I want some see some of the causes or the reasons for this. First, why does he cry out? He experiences physical pain and the reality of death. Verse three. My life draws near the grave. Sheol is a place for the dead. Verse 4, I am counted among those who go down into the pit. Verse 5, I am set apart with the dead. <laughs> it's like he's already buried in a mass grave, and he feels like God has forgotten all about him. Verse 15, I am close to death from his youth. Is that something? There are people that go through sickness for a long time, years and years of sickness. I remember a lady... In my second church, she was in her 30s, early 40s. I came to the door one time to see this good friend. And there she's on her hands and knees to meet me at the door. Years of suffering, she went through. So he says, I've been, been close to death from his youth. So he experiences physical pain and that reality of death. Two, he experiences relational and emotional pain by losing close friends. We see this in verses 8 and 18. Charles Spurgeon, we'll talk about him in a few minutes, said, It is very hard when those who should be the first to come to the rescue are the first to desert us. Isn't that true? It is very hard when those who should be the first to come to the rescue are the very first to desert us. And so due to his sickness, the psalmist says, my closest friends are repulsed by him, verse 8. And verse 18 tells us that his companions and his loved ones have abandoned him. And now he lives in isolation with no one to turn to in his darkest hours. One person at Trinity Seminary, Free Church Seminary in Deerfield, Illinois, Dr. Lloyd Perry would say, beware of the first people people to meet you at the train station. <laughs> the very first people to meet you at the train station sometimes can end up being your enemies. I've experienced that. The ones who could be the most welcoming could turn around and say bye bye later on. I've experienced that myself. And so this experience of being abandoned and rejected by the closest friends is similar to Paul who tells us everyone deserted me. And he was in prison, 2 Timothy 4. Third, the psalmist experiences spiritual pain with God. And the psalmist tells us a few reasons why he experiences this spiritual uh, 
abandoned by God. First, he says, God is responsible for putting me through all this. Look at verse 6. You have put me in the lowest pit, in the darkest depths. Verse 7. You have overwhelmed me. Verse 8. You have taken away my friends, but he does not know why. And then the psalmist asks a number of questions to kind of push God, to take some action. In verses 10 to 12. Knowing that he may soon die, the psalmist asks God, Why do you show your wonders to the dead? Verse 10. Do the dead rise up and praise God? Do the dead declare God's love and faithfulness? Verse 11. Are God's wonders and righteous deeds known to the dead? And the response to each one of these questions is, No, they don't do that. They don't praise you. They don't rise up and declare your love. So God, because you are responsible, you can act. And you can lift me up so that I can praise you. I can declare your goodness. I can declare your love. So act God. Because you are responsible, you can act on my behalf. Because the dead can't do that. And I want to praise you. So raise me up, Lord, so I can praise you. And so the psalmist is expressing belief that God can turn things around so that he can once again praise God and give him the glory. The third reason why God, why the psalmist feels like God is abandoning him is that he feels that God has rejected him. Okay? God has rejected him. So the psalmist comes to God day after day for his help, but God remains silent. Verse 14, why, O oh Lord, do you reject me? Why do you hide your face from me? Why? Why? And he concludes that God has rejected him because God has not answered him at all. The psalmist has no clue why he is going through this painful time. A good friend of ours, he's had serious back problems and then had some other, med other physical issues. And he said the pain was just excruciating. He was just beyond, just beyond pain. It was just so awful. I saw him last week and much better now. He says, I don't know why God allowed this in his life. God hasn't revealed why. There's no reasons why. It's just, there it is. There it is. And it's hard at that time. So this is, this feeling of being rejected by God is not unique to the psalm. There's six other psalms that express the same thing about feeling rejected, abandoned by God. So it's no wonder that the psalmist is full of grief, as we see in verse 9. The third reason that he is experiencing this spiritual abandonment by God is that he really feels that his troubles are an expression of God's wrath on his life. We see this in verses 16 and 17. So he just concludes that God is angry at him. God is angry at him. And God's wrath is like a a flood or a tsunami that just comes in and just destroys everything. So he says, God's wrath is like that, like a tsunami that sweeps over him. It's the old expression, when it rains, it pours. <laughs> and you just feel like, oh, why is God continuing to bring all this upon me? He must be angry at me. And sometimes believers, believers believe that. Believers think it's because God's angry. But dear friends, God's wrath has been paid for on the cross. The propitiation of Jesus Christ, the wrath toward us has been paid for. It's gone on the cross. And now we are his friends. Yes, he disciplines us, he loves us, but the wrath of God is gone against us. We are his friends, we are his children, he loves us. Doesn't mean we'll not go through tough times, but the wrath of God is against us, gone. Like that, this wrath has been satisfied. So here we have three types of pain, which are described in very, very graphic detail. Physical, relational, emotional, and spiritual. And again, these are three kinds of suffering that have been experienced by the saints all throughout the centuries, including Charles Spurgeon. It's Charles Spurgeon, the prince of preachers, this great, great preacher, in Great Britain in the 1800s, my oh my, he pastored a church that grew from a few hundred people to uh, 5,000 members over a few years. He preached several times a week. He published innumerable books. 
Uh, he started a pastor's training college. He started an orphanage. He started an alms house for the widows and poor people. This man was incredible. A man who loved God. And yet, a man who faced incredible suffering. He experienced physical pain. In his mid-30s, he began experiencing gout. Not once, not twice, but an ongoing experience with gout. A friend of mine has had gout. That's miserable. Maybe some of you have experienced that. That is a painful thing. I'm not having it. But listening to my friend, it's a painful thing. And he, would ex he experienced gout for a long time. It was prolonged and painful. And as a result, his arms and feet were swollen. It was very hard for him to walk. Often he was confined to bed for periods of time. He could not even leave his bedroom. He had also then developed a kidney disease, chronic nephritis, and that caused more severe pain, restricted his breathing, affected his whole body. He could not preach for many, many weeks at a time. Just really, really afflicted with physical sickness from age 30, in his mid 30s till the time he died at age 57. He also experienced relational pain. When he started off, moved from the rural areas of Great London, or from England to London, the media were mocking him, mocking him, criticizing him, laughing at him because of the way he preached. In his own denomination, people, including some of his former students, rejected him because he was holy to the truth of God's word, the inerrancy of God's word, and students rejected him, some of them. His own brother and him had a falling out because of these kind of issues. And then he experienced that emotional and spiritual pain. Early in his pastorate, his, they moved into this large building. Five, six, or six or seven people died because someone called fire and people rushed out in a panic. People were killed. This was so dramatic that some people say it affected him the rest of his life. This trauma of the service where people were killed. He went through a plague of London, had great people in his own church, he was in his early 20s. He went through so much. And on the Psalm 88, Spurgeon himself said, Am I always to suffer? Will the Lord never relieve me? Has he ceased from the sacred surgery? Has God forgotten to be gracious? These are Spurgeon's words in Psalm 88. He could relate very much to the psalm. <laughs> so, how does this psalm, what does the psalm have to say to us? Let me draw a third thing here, third point here. How can the psalm help us? First of all, the psalm encourages us that we are not alone in pain. Pain and suffering are part of the human experience. Doesn't matter how spiritual we are, we will experience suffering and pain in our lives. It is part of the human experience. We live in a sinful world. We live in a sinful world, and we will experience that. Our bodies are affected by sin. So that it's part of our human existence like that. And so we often think our pain is unique, and no one else could be going through what I'm going through. But the psalmist reminds us, hey, you're not alone. Others have gone through it, including the psalmist. And that's encouraging, isn't it? Because sometimes they think, oh, who could ever go through what I'm going through? And then you get talking, so oh, someone else is going through Oh, I'm not all alone. Oh, or someone else has gone through that. The psalmist reminds us, we've gone through those things too. And that itself is encouraging like that, that our situation is not unique, that others, including fellow believers, have gone through these same kind of situations. And this is wonderful for the church. This is where the church can show that empathy and support with one another. Say, yeah, I know what it's gone through. A woman who, who uh, uh, has a miscarriage, and all of a sudden others say, oh, I've had a miscarriage. Oh, oh, I can support you. I can understand what you've gone through, the grief and suffering. You know, those kind of things. Go on and on, where the church can say, yes, it's not unique what you're going through. We can support you. We understand. We've gone through this kind of thing. And so this psalm helps us to move on from the, the denial of our pain to expressing our pain to God and to other people who can support us and say, yes, we are here to support you, we love you, we care for you. And this psalm helps us to move from confused emotions to articulate our emotions before God. 
And so this home helps, also helps me to understand the deep questions and feel the deep pain of others, what they go through. I may not experience something, oh, wow, that's okay, but this song helps me understand the depths of pain and suffering people go through. Sometimes when we're younger, people don't understand. This song helps us say, wow, people do go through deep times. It gives me an insight into what they may be going through. So that's the first way. The second way is that the song encourages us to have a personal relationship with Jesus. In our, in our darkest days, who do we turn to? The psalmist turns to the Lord because he knew what God is like. Our hope is in Jesus Christ, as we sang earlier. And so we want to turn to God, to Jesus Christ, who is absolutely and irrevocably committed to me, even if I fail him. Paul tells us that nothing shall separate us from the love of Jesus Christ. But we say, death, demons, any powers, or anything else can never separate us from God's love. Our pain is not an indication that God's love for us is diminished. It is not. It is not. For we tell, learn in Hebrews 12 that God loves us so much like a son that he wants to discipline us so that we are transformed to become more like Jesus. We don't like it, but God loves us. He wants the best for us to be transformed. Mm -hmm. And so we want to turn to a God who I know who has shown his love to me, his faithfulness and wonders to me in the past, and say, this is the God I turn to. He's loved me in the past. He's committed to me, unconditionally committed to me. And I can turn to him knowing he loves me so very much. <laughs> Thirdly, the psalm encourages us to go deep in our faith in the Lord. Oh my, you know this, I know this. Our personal pain and suffering can severely, severely test our faith in the Lord. We keep wrestling, and praying, and trusting God, but this is hard when we don't feel God is hearing our cries of suffering. And this is what happens in Psalm 88. We do not see an answer to the psalmist's cry. He does not end up rejoicing God. Lord, thank you for answering my prayer. We do not see the psalm. Not everything in this lifetime will be answered. The wayward child may not come back to the Lord until you pass away. God will not give to us everything in this world. Not every prayer is answered in our lifetime. Psalm, uh, Hebrews chapter, uh, not everything from the Psalms, Hebrew, <laughs> Hebrews 11, 39, speaks about the heroes of faith. These were the heroes of faith in Hebrews 11. And guess what it says in verse 39? None of them received what had been promised. None of them had received what had been promised. Not everything we get will receive in this lifetime. That's hard. But God will answer in his due time. And so, even though God may not answer our prayer for healing, may not answer the prayer for reconciliation, our pain and suffering do have a purpose. Peter tells us that we may suffer grief, all kinds of trials. Now, we will experience all kinds of trials, and that'll be our grief and our sorrow. But he does so, God does so in our lives, allows these things to take place in our life so that our character will be purified and our faith in the Lord will be deepened like never before. We can go so deep in our trusting God. And this is not because God's angry with us, but because he loves us. And so he wants to purify our character. He wants to transform us. And he wants our faith to go deep, deep, deep into God. And so these are... These times of pain and suffering are the dark night of the soul. There are the times when everything is stripped away from us. And like Jonah, we're in the, we're in the fish's belly for three nights, three days. Dark times. But you know what? In those dark times is when God speaks to us. When everything else is stripped away, all the voices, all the props, all the things we depend on, all we have is God. In the deep, dark, negative soul, God can speak to us. He's got our attention. And God can do his good work in our lives. 
And so the psalmist says, what does he say here? He makes this remarkable comment in verse, in, in verse the last verse. The darkness is my closest friend. Have you experienced that? When the darkness is your closest friend? Everything else is stripped away. And I say, Lord, I just have you. How am I to go more intimately? I can assure you, if you have not gone to him, these are times where you will grow in intimacy with Jesus Christ. You will know his presence and his fellowship. And God will do, strip away all, everything else and say, Lord, humble me, bring me, help me to be closer to you than ever before. God does that in our lives. Yes, darkness can be our closest friend. And so God does amazing things to us in the times of suffering and pain. And our prayer life becomes intense as we become acutely aware of our defense on God like never before. Fourthly, this psalm encourages us to minister to others who are suffering. Fourth point. We can share what we have gone through if we have had the same experiences. And Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, he says, oh, we've gone through dark times, painful times. But God, the God of comfort has comforted us so that what? We can comfort other people. So you can use those dark times to minister to other people. This is wonderful. And so we can give them this psalm when they are struggling with guilt, concerning their feelings of guilt and their attitude that God has rejected them. And so we can be like, um, we can be like Job's friends who have answered every question. We don't have to answer all your questions with why, why, why. But we can comfort them. See, God is with you. He is with you in this dark time. And so we should not be shocked when our dear friends express a strong language which appears to be accusing God. We can walk with those people during the deep trials of life. We can share from our trials to minister and comfort them as they go through their difficult times. And then fifthly, the psalm encourages us by pointing us to Jesus here. Pointing to Jesus. Ha! Ah, now we go from the darkness to the light. It's just a few weeks ago we celebrated Easter, the resurrection. This is our hope here. This psalm reminds us of what Jesus endured while on the earth, including the events leading up to his death. He faced physical pain. He experienced the relational pain of people abandoning him, his closest friends, his disciples. He experienced the spiritual pain of saying, why, why have you forsaken me, Father, on the cross? He has experienced that. It's quite possible that Jesus prayed not only Psalm 22, but this Psalm as well, who he fully knew this one, of course, being God. And he would really relate to the Psalm like, like no one else ever could, because he would understand this song. So this means Jesus is not aloof or caring about our pain. He fully understands our grief, our pain, because he has entered most fully into his pain in his dark days, physically, relationally, and spiritually. He understands what's like. What a comfort it is to know that God understands our grief, our pain, our sorrows, our struggles. And Jesus suffering then points us beyond the grave to the resurrection. He conquered death on the third day, and thus his death does not have the final say in our lives. And this gives us a new perspective to suffering and our, the painful experiences we go through. Paul tells us in uh, 2 Corinthians 4, For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us eternal glory that far away is among. That's our perspective. We got glory. That is heavy. That's weighty compared to our light afflictions. That's our perspective because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And plus, our bodies will be resurrected one day, Romans 8. And we look forward to that day when our faith will be purified and all our tears and all of our suffering will end. And we will be with Jesus forever. This is the great conclusion to our faith in Jesus Christ through the resurrection of Him. So how do you, how should you and I respond to this psalm? this morning, let me mention a few things. You may be accepting what you're going through in life, and that is so, so wonderful. And this passage reminds us that we just can't bench these things on our own. 
We need God's grace. We need his presence in our lives. Are you doing that? Are you going through a dark time? Are you saying, Lord, I need your grace. I need your presence. Not trade to anything else, but just saying, Lord, I need to focus on you and focus on you and allow you to minister to me. There's no other alternatives. But perhaps you're trying to deny your grief, your sorrow, your pain, deep inside your life. And you're trying to pretend everything is okay. And you're trying to tell everyone else life is okay. But deep down, you're full of pain and you're hurt. This passage is instructing us to be truthful by acknowledging what we have been facing in life. And you can cry out to the Lord. Are you crying out to the Lord? Are you acknowledging your grief, your sorrow? There's no shame in that. God understands. He's familiar with our grief. He's familiar with soul. Are you crying out your heart to God? It's no good just to keep it deep down inside of ourselves. Hurting us, wounding us. God wants us to pour it out. Like the psalmist does. He's our example, the psalmist. To do that. So, this psalm is encouraging us to cry out to God. Not to keep it stuck inside ourselves. It's so important to do that. I think of what happened in Maori Park with the killings that took place there. And for a long period of time, having councils <coughs> available for the people in Maori Park to deal with the grief and so forth. That we deal with and acknowledge it and pour our heart to God and to other people rather than keep it inside of us. I knew a man who came into our mission, shortly after he came into his mission, his son was electrocuted because of how his father, the father had done the wires. His son was washing his dog. It was on a chain. And his son was electrocuted. That father could never really deal with that. And honestly, now I need help. I need to acknowledge him. He just wanted to bury himself in his work. Pretend it was never there. That's an awful way. The psalm teaches us to be open. Be vulnerable before God even to other people in that regard. If you're going through dark times, you may be understandably resentful, angry, bitter toward God. Lord, I've been a faithful servant of yours. I've been following you. Why, Lord, are you doing this? If you need to confess this to the Lord, ask him to change your heart. I'll give you the grace to accept that. Confess your anger. And confess your bitterness and resentment to the Lord God. And say, Lord, I hold these feelings. I know you love me. Help me to surrender and acknowledge these feelings before you and acknowledge your love for me. You do really love me. This is so, so important. And then also, don't focus just on yourself. Focus on others. Take the pain of the grief you've gone through. Who can you minister to? You've gone through difficult times. Been able to minister to other people. It's so good after the years of pastoral ministry and all that I've gone through in my life to meet with the students at ITS, International Theological Seminary, and minister to them and encourage them. So we don't just focus on ourselves and all our grief. God wants to take that and use it to other people. Am I ministering to other people through what I've gone through? I think it's Henry Nolan that talks about pain is a redemptive pain. It's a redemptive pain. So that we can redeem our pain by ministering to other people that regard as well. So may God encourage us this morning in this song to be honest before God, allowing Him to take all that He's going through in our lives, to transform our lives, to cry out before God, acknowledge it, allow His love to bathe us with His love in the ministry of the people. But be honest with God. Be honest with God, the emotions are filled. Pain, grief, resentment, anger, do God understands. <laughs> he just wants to bathe us in his love for us. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this song. Thank you for this psalmist who is brutally honest before you, expressing his deepest heart's cries before you. Thank you that he's turning, he turns to you as we are reminded to turn to you. We're reminded to acknowledge our grief, our sorrow, 
pain, resentment, and anger. And Lord, that you are the covenant God who loves us so much. Bathe us with your love. Thank you that we can confess and you forgive. Lord, help us then to, to see your hand on our lives, to transform our lives, to make us holy people, and shape us to be more like you. Help us go deep in our faith in you, our walk with you. Forgive us, Lord, when we turn to other things other than you or other godly people. Help us to just to go deep in you. Lord, use our past experiences, our present experiences to minister to others, not in mere platitudes and shallow, trite answers, but knowing that we've gone through it and we can just walk with other people and comfort them. So use your word this morning, Father. Use our lives to minister to others as well. Thank you, Jesus, we pray in your name. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.